but he could not and would not know happiness. There was something within him, a brokenness, not a bitterness, but a bruise that would not let him feel the blessing and the joy of happiness. Day after day, he knew what it was to be abandoned and to be brutalized by simply being a slave. But Henry one day walking now, older than 15, we don't know his exact age, is walking down the street near Richmond. And he sees this beautiful brown sister. He begins to think that maybe I could have a family of my own. They begin to be friends and know each other and they get permission and they are married. Now he's beginning to blossom again. He's beginning to know that his life can be complete, that his life can be full of happiness, that he can be a whole person. I mean, he's dancing again. He's singing again, just not in public. Until one day while he's handling the same tobacco leaves, someone rushes into the factory and says, Henry, Henry, they're selling your wife and children. Now a grown man, having raised children, having loved children, watching them be born, birthed into life, shaping their personality, naming them, identifying with them, teaching them. And suddenly, in a whim and a wish, his children are gone. His wife is gone. And so now for five months, he is so depressed that he can still collect these leaves from the fields, but he can do no more. He does not want to live until one day he says that God spoke to him, and he had to be free. He began to talk to God, and God began to talk to him. He had two friends. One, who was not a slave, was a white brother who loved him. He owned a store, and he began to talk to him about the possibility of his freedom. They, talk, they talked about him running. They talked about him going through the swamps, and he said, nah, man, that's not for me. And he began to pray again. And he says in his writings that it was as though God whispered in my ear, and God said, Henry, mail yourself in a box. He found another friend who was a carpenter, and they formed and shaped a box that was about three feet wide and two and a half feet tall. That's not very big. So they planned and they plotted, but he couldn't get away long enough to begin the shipping process. And so he said, I've got to get free. This is worth it. I'll do whatever it takes. He took some acid and he poured it on his hand, burning his hand. He went to the master and said, I, I need to take a day or two off so I can heal. He said, absolutely not, wrap that thing up and go back to work. Now Henry was not daunted or deterred because he knew that he had to be free. He took now his hand and he poured acid upon acid upon acid, eating down to the very bone of his fingers. This time when he went to his master, the master said, we don't know how you did that but you need to take some time off before infection set in. And so now Henry, his hand is in pain, but his heart is filled with joy. He's placed in a box, nailed shut, and for 27 hours, he's upside right and upside down, he's bounced around, he's on horseback, he's on train, and he's on boat, until he arrives into a place called Philadelphia. When he gets to Philadelphia, he receives a tap on the box, and they say, Henry, are you all right? He says, I'm all right. And then he says he experienced his resurrection. He says that when they opened the box, it was as though he was experiencing a new life. It was as though he was dead before in slavery, but is alive now in freedom. He says, that's when my life began. In fact, he says, that's my birthday. And in a very real sense, Henry would go on to focus his life on making sure that every person who was in bondage, that every person who was a slave would be free. So Henry joined what were called the abolitionists. Would you say that the abolitionists? And the goal was for them to abolish slavery. His whole life's mission was to see that nobody had to remain a slave anymore. His whole life's focus, he said, I've got to make sure that everybody is set free. And when I thought about Henry Story, who is born near us and lived near us, I couldn't help but think about the reality that in a very real sense that you and I have been called to be abolitionist. That God has said because you were a slave, because you were in bondage, regardless of your race, if you are a spiritual being, which you are, you were born into sin, you were shaped in iniquity, you were in the bondage of hell, you, you were going, you were destined for damnation until God saw fit for somebody to help you get free. And just like Henry, having known what it is to suffer 
the damnation of hell, the depression of sin, knowing what it is to be in bondage to sin, knowing what it is that you really can't experience joy no matter what you try, knowing what it is that your destination is hell, when you get freedom, what you ought to be and what you ought to do is be an abolitionist. You ought to look around this world and find somebody who you can set free. Find somebody that you're willing to reach out and risk to help them see freedom. That's what we're called to do. I believe that in a very real sense, I believe we can learn a lot from this text in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, because I think if we think about that box, we can learn a lot. You know, life is really all about boxes. If you thought about life, there are temporary boxes, those things that don't last forever, Temporary boxes, maybe a house, maybe a car, maybe some clothes. Look at your shoes. I know you like those new shoes. Amen. And maybe some jewelry. And maybe even somebody's boot. Uh, but those are temporary boxes. They don't last forever. But then there are titillating boxes. Titillating boxes are those things that just make us feel good. Sometimes it's things or sometimes it's doing something. Whatever it is, it may be good or it may be bad. It may be a sin or it may be amoral. Whatever it is, it doesn't last forever. The box, all the boxes we create in this life are really empty. Now, I know that doesn't feel good and we don't want to hear that on a Sunday morning, but really every box we create on this earth is an empty box. It does not last forever. When we open it, hoping to find what we thought we would find, at the end of the day, it's just empty. Oh, there's somebody here who had some experience, and they knew as soon as, as soon as they got that new house, they'd feel different. They knew as soon as they said, I do, everything would be happy. They knew as soon as they got the job, they'd be content. But the truth is, all of the earthly boxes that we create are really empty. But there is a box, and that's the eternal box. <laughs> Y'all missing this. There's a box called the eternal box. And everything you put in the eternal box lasts forever. It, it really does. It, it lasts past your existence on this side. It means the most, and it lasts forever. The eternal box is the a box of e things that are eternal. Let me give you the four kernel corners of these boxes because it's really about helping people see Jesus. Would you say that? Helping people see Jesus what it's about. The first corner of the box is the reality that winning souls is the chief concern. Would you say chief concern? Chief concern. What does that mean? That means that at God's heart, his priority, the most important thing, the thing that he is most concerned about is people coming to him. You know why he came to earth? He didn't come to earth just to heal the sick. He didn't just come to earth just to show us how to live. He didn't come to earth so he could be written up in the scriptures, but he came to earth. And that's why we have John 3.16, because it tells his story. He came to earth so that you and I could get to know him, so we could be saved, so we could have salvation. Salvation is the most important thing. Salvation is the thing that we should be most concerned about. Now, I know that's hard for us to celebrate on because we don't think of life primarily about salvation. We, we don't even think in churches, typically, I'm not talking about this church, I'm talking about generally. We don't think of churches primarily about salvation. We think of churches primarily about a culture, a club, and comfort. Don't be mad at me. We, we do, we do. Amen. We, we think about a culture, I can come and I can see my friends and I can wear my dress and I can hook up and, you know, just enjoy myself and have a good collective body of people. Don't be mad at me. Amen. A, a culture. Uh, but then, uh, like a club, you know, it's, it, it, we know you and you know me and we're friends. We hang out together. We drink tea together. Amen. We, 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 we do things together. It, it's a club. But then comfort. You know, we've got to be comfortable. It, it's too hot. The seat's not padded enough. The sermon's too long or just not exciting enough or just not titillating. It, it, it's comfort. We want comfort. We want to be excited. We, we want to always be jumping and dancing and shouting. Oh, that's it. That's comfort. I feel good when I go there. And that's typically what we think about church. But do you know God doesn't think about church that way? God doesn't say that I've called you to be part of this church so you can be comfortable. In fact, can I tell you the truth? And don't be mad at me. I love you enough to tell you and then I'll go out the back door. Hey, the truth is, God says most of the time that you are comfortable, you're not productive. <laughs> Y'all missing this. Woo. Most of the time that you are in your seat of comfort, you are not where I want you to be. In fact, God says I'm willing for you to be uncomfortable so that you can be Usable. Woo! Y'all missed it. Amen. I'm sorry. I calmed down. 
Okay, if you don't believe me, think of the scriptures and every person who is considered a person of great faith had a time of great discomfort. Moses didn't know what was going to happen. Moses didn't know about the Red Sea until after he crossed it. It was uncomfortable. Uh, you, you go throughout the Bible. Paul, he wrote most of his epistles not in a comfortable place, not at his desk in his office, but while he was in prison, chained, uncomfortable. Okay, let me move on forward. Uh, uh, most of all, Jesus. Jesus did what he did the way he did, uncomfortable. He didn't say, oh, I don't, I don't mind the cross. This is easy for me. No, he said, this is uncomfortable. He said, uh, is there any way I can get a different cup? Because this cup is not the cup I desire. But then he said, well, Lord, if it is your will, I will drink from this bitter cup. Oh, 